Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Look with me to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up with the shepherds this morning. And uh, I declare to you that <clears throat> whatever questions you may have brought with you this morning, Jesus is the answer. I spent the first 20 years of my life asking a bunch of questions. I found out that uh, when I was 20 years old that all the questions that I ever had running through my mind was Jesus, was the answer. I wanted to know, uh, who am I? I, I discovered that uh, I am a human being made in the image of God that was designed for the explicit purpose of knowing God. Uh, who am I? What's the purpose of my life? Where am I going? And uh, I, I, I'll tell you when that 20 year que question was answered in my life, I I discovered I'm going to glory. I'm going to heaven one of these days. And the only reason I am going to heaven is because of the relationship that I have with God through Jesus Christ. Now you're going to go to one of two places. You're either going to know Jesus, go to heaven when you die, or the Bible says that you're going to be spending eternity in hell because you believe not in the only begotten Son of God. And the Bible says you're condemned already because you don't believe that he is the son of God. So one of two places. So these questions now you may have brought with you this morning may be entirely different. You may not be asking who am I, what am I doing here, and where am I going to go. You may be having all kinds of other questions that may be bombarding your thinking. Can I just say to you, Jesus is the answer to those questions. He's the answer to every question that you may have in this life. Now, I want us to pick it up this morning in verse number eight. And uh, just simply to the first point is that God meets us where we are. God meets us where we are. Look at verse number eight, if you will, in uh, chapter two. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, this country that he's talking about there, we're in the same country. He's talking about a region of land about two miles outside the city of Bethlehem. Uh, there's a section out there, and I've been to it many times, uh, hoping to go back again in May and would love for you to go with me. But uh, it's called the Shepherd's Field. And, and that's where these shepherds were. And, and the Bible says that they were guarding their sheep. Uh, in the middle of the night. Now, shepherds uh, were in, Bible, in the Bible, when you read about shepherds, they, they have a kind of a romantic kind of viewpoint that we get from the scriptures. They have a very positive viewpoint. If you study the Old Testament, you discover that even David was a shepherd. But in the culture of Jesus' day, they were not considered to be so positive. As a matter of fact, uh, they were the lowest of the low. They would be considered like the gypsies that would just uh, traverse the countryside going from place to place and from job to job and so forth and so on. They couldn't even, uh, they, they, they didn't even have the integrity or the character in that culture to be able to even testify in court. They were shepherds, the Bible says. Uh, here, keeping sheep uh, in this despised profession. Now, that shows us a little bit of the glimpse of the type people that God came looking for. It gives us a little glimpse into who God is interested in even today. Now, uh, we could today ask those of you that are in the audience this morning, I would say to you, all right, here's what I want you to come and do for me. I want you to get up out of your seat. I want you to come forward down here. And, and I want you to tell this congregation what it is in your life that you are the most proud of. And there may be many of you here that couldn't do that. You couldn't come up with one single thing that you'd like everybody to know, man, this is what I'm proud of. You just don't have it. May I say to you, 
God loves you. God deeply loves you. And he comes after ordinary people like the shepherds and like you and me. These shepherds couldn't even, they, they couldn't even get a day shift job. They were keeping their sheep at night according to the word of God and he came after them. Now I don't know how many there were. Uh, there, the Bible tells us in verse number eight that there were more than one. There were several of them as a matter of fact. I think probably in the neighborhood of three or four which indicates that they had a big herd uh, of sheep. Now, why would they need a, why, why do sheep need shepherds? Why do they have to have somebody to look after? They're dumb. One of the dumbest animals in the world. I, I've, had, I, I've had a dumb animal. I, right after Kathy and I got married, I don't know what possessed me. I, have, I, have, I, I was just doing stupid back those days and I bought a dumb poodle. I just thought, well, I'll get this poodle. Came home one day from work and that dumb poodle had gotten into a bottle of glue. <laughs> Ruined the only blanket that we had in the house. He had glue all over his face. I don't believe he could open his lips. He just glued shut. Dumb dog. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? <laughs> Sheep are just dumb animals. They're about as dumb of an animal as you can get. You, 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 don't, you don't find chickens have to have somebody watching over them every minute of the day. You don't have to have a, somebody watching over a cow every minute of the day. But sheep have to have shepherds because these these sheep would just wander off. They'd just leave the herd and just go on about their own deal, doing their own thing. And the shepherd would have to go out and, and what are you doing out here? Well, I just thought I'd make my way out. <laughs> I don't know why I'm here. The shepherd would have to bring them back and they're dumb. Well, the Bible says that Jesus is the good shepherd. Well, who are the sheep? If Jesus is the shepherd, then I guess we're the sheep and we're just, we have to have a shepherd because we're just dumb. Well, I can get to heaven any way I want to go. Uh, I'll just be a good person. I think that there, I, I heard one lady say on television, I think that there are just many roots into heaven. And, and, and just whichever route that you choose, then it'll be okay when you get dumb sheep that have to have a shepherd. You, you understand they were guarding their flock. That's what the shepherds were doing. That's where Jesus found them. He found them protecting the sheep. I want to ask you a question this morning. Where did God find you? What did he find you doing when he found you? You. The Bible says these folks were outside the city, if you will. God was thinking about these shepherds. He had these shepherds on his mind. Where were you when God found you? What's your story? I'm going to tell you mine. I can tell you my story pretty quick. I was just doing my own deal. And for the last four years of my life, I'd said, you know what? God, if that's the only difference that you can make in somebody's life, I don't need you. And from the time that I was about 16 years old to the time that I was about 20, I didn't have any use for God whatsoever. I felt like, God, if you can't change me, if you can't give me this gift, if you can, then I don't need you. And if that's the only, got to have my eyes on people. And if that's the only difference that you can make in that hypocrisy that I'm watching and seeing, if that's all you got, God, I don't need you. But God found me. Found me out in Colleen, Texas. Hey, hey, I know some of your stories. I, I look in the faces of some of you. I, I know where God found some of you. I look in the face this morning of a young man called me at three o'clock in the morning. He was just out of his mind. Called me 
Pastor, I need you. And I got up out of my bed, drove over to his house. He's here this morning. Drove over to his house, 3 o'clock. He was as drunk as a skunk. Looked on his wrist, and he'd had one of those stamps on his wrist. I said, where you been? He said, well, and he told me what club he had been to. He says, I'm done with that. God found him at 3 o'clock in the morning in a den in his house. He's never been the same since. What's your story? Where did God find you? The second thing is not only uh, God comes and finds us, he moves us to our knees. He knocks us to our knees. Look at verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now notice the term angel of the Lord. Underline it, highlight it, draw attention to it somehow. Uh, it, it means a mess sometimes in Scripture. It, it, it's a very complex term, very complex term. Sometimes in Scripture it means messenger of the Lord. And then at other times in Scripture you discover that it's more than just a messenger of the Lord. You discover that it very well could be a pre-incarnate visit of the Lord himself. Fifty times in the Old Testament it is used a dozen times in the New Testament. So, so what's the deal here? This, this messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord shows up. Look with me, if you will, at Judges chapter number 2 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, listen to this, this angel said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Well, <clears throat> who does that sound like? It doesn't sound like a messenger to me. It sounds like the Lord himself. So here's one of those visits uh, of the Lord before he ever showed up there in Bethlehem. The point being, ladies and gentlemen, when the angel of the Lord shows up, you really need to make sure you're listening. Now notice what the scripture says. And... Uh, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. He, he's talking about the Shekinah glory of the Lord. It, it got daylight real quick out there in the dark desert with these shepherds. When the glory of the Lord was everywhere around them. And the Bible says in my King James Version, I don't know what version you may have with you, but King James says that you've studied it all your life. It says, and they were sore afraid. They were terrified. Uh, they were absolutely mortified at what was going on around them. They, they were scared to death. In, in other words, when God comes looking for you, his next thing is that he's going to bring you to your knees. Look with me, if you will, at 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 16. Uh, the Bible says, uh, And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces, encountered the Lord. When the angel of the Lord showed up, when God showed up, they were scared to death. When God showed up, they fell on their face before God. I, I, you've heard me say this numerous times down through the years but, but, I, but I don't tell you, folks, I, I don't really have any patience with people who refer to God as the man upstairs. He's not the man upstairs. He's not your buddy. He, 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 he's not your big brother. The Bible says he's a consuming fire and that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And, and this idea that you're a good person, you're a good guy, and, and, and because of your goodness, somehow or other, God's going to just let you get in and slide in under the door is ridiculous. When you encounter God, I promise you, you're going to be 
sawed off and cut off at the knees. You're going to be on your face. You're going to be on your knees before God. Now, by the way, let me just say to this, the posture of the body is not nearly as important as the posture of the human heart. He meets us where we are, and then he brings us to this place of humility. And by the way, let me just say this. You can't come to God just any time that you want to, and you can't come to God until you get these two views rightly in your mind of how holy that God is, how awesome God is, how majestic God is, and how lowly that you are. And until you get those two things in your mind, you're never going to come to God. You can't be reconciled to God until you understand the difference between who he is and who we are. And there may be some of you that are in here this morning, you may be meeting God in a very fresh way today. There's some kind of circumstance that has happened to you in your life. There's some event, there is some scenario going on in your life that maybe it has got you to the point that you're trying to figure it out. I can't manage this. I can't handle this on my own. And it may very well be that God has allowed whatever it is that's happened in your life to get you to a place of humility before him so that he can meet you where you are, so that you can get to the point that you cry out, yes, God, I do need you. I've had people say this to me and it's just, I just agree with them. They, they say, well, you know, this thing, this religious thing, this spiritual thing, this Jesus thing, that's nothing in a world but a crutch that you have to lean on. And you know what I say to them? You're exactly right. Because there's a lot of times, there's a lot of circumstances, there's a lot of situations that God has allowed to come and invade my life and I'm just going to tell you, I can't handle it. And if I didn't have Jesus to rely on, I couldn't get through it. Yes, he's a crutch. Thank God I've got him to lean on. All right, he meets us where we are. He brings us to our knees. And then he shares with us some good news. Watch this with me, if you will, in the word. Uh, and the angel in verse 10 said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Hey, aren't you glad that when God meets you and God allows things to come into your life that brings you to your knees into a sense of humility, that God doesn't just stand over you and chide you and kick you to the curb and say, hey, hey look at you. No. He brings us good news. Say that word with me. Good news. Fear not. Don't be afraid. I found that very interesting. He scared them to death. And then he said, don't be afraid. But, but that's just God. I bring you good news. It's what the world seldom hears of great joy. It's something that the world desperately needs. To all people, there's just the world out there that says, well, that may be for some people, but the word of God says it's for everybody. Good news. Well, what is the good news? What, what's the good news? Jesus, what, what, what's the good news? Jesus, what, what, somebody give me something else. What, what's the good news? Salvation. What's the good news? Huh? Forgiveness. What's the good news? Mercy, grace. What's the good news? You understand that sin has separated man from God. We couldn't get to God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to come into this world world to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We can't get to God. We can't pay the penalty. But Jesus came, stretched himself out on an old rugged cross and paid the debt that I could never pay. And he proved himself to be God when he rose from the dead. That's good news. I can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. That's good news. Amen. 
Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He meets us where we are. He brings us to our knees. He shares good news. And then he fills our hearts with praise. Watch this in verse 13 and 14. And suddenly, suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. They, they, they were not dressed up for war. They were dressed up for worship. An angel of multitude of the heavenly host. What, what were they doing? Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. Were they saying glory to God in heaven? No, that didn't need to happen. That was already happening. Glory to God in heaven is already taking place. Glory to God in the highest places of all of creation. That's already going on. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying the expression of worship to God in the highest sense in the lowest of circumstances, in the lowest of places. There are some of you that are going through some very difficult times. I know this. I've talked to you. I've shared those things. And you're going through it right now. And you walk down this aisle and you have a microphone and you say, you know what? I'm going through tough times. I lost my job. I've got bad health problems. I've got all kinds of family issues. But glory to God. He's got it. I'm hurting, but praise his name. I'm going through hardships, but hallelujah. And God is getting glory in the highest expressions among the lowest of all places. Powerful presentation in verses 13 and 14 that really ought to be on the lips of every one of us in this room. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter what exigency in life that we are encountering, we still ought to be saying hallelujah. It's tough, I'm hurting, but God is God. And God is good. All right, let me give you number five. He fills our hearts with peace. Now notice what he says. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace Goodwill toward men. Another unfortunate, really, translation here in the King James. It's not what he really, really is saying. He's not saying here, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill that comes from men. That's not at all what he is encountering. Well, who is he talking about here? Whose goodwill? He's talking about God's goodwill. Peace to men and women of God's good will who are people, men and women, who are able to say, you know what, i got it going on with God. I've got the favor of God resting on me. And you're saying, wait a minute, how do I get that? You ready for this? You come to God on God's terms and not your own terms. Y'all noticed I'm losing a lot of weight. Just shake your head like that. You don't have to just... just just agree with me on this. So I was sitting reading the paper and watching the news the other night at supper. And uh, when Kathy gets through cooking, she, she means for you to come right then and there. I, I've labored over this meal. I want you in here. I'm thinking to myself, I really care what you want. I'll, I'll come when you call me three times, not the first time. It's the last meal that's been on my table ever since too, you know. Mm. I, I called the bank the other day and I, I, I told the banker, I said, I want to I renegotiate my mortgage on my house and, and, and I, tell, me, tell me what you got. He says, well, uh, I've got a 30-year fixed mortgage at 7%. I said, 7%? Are you crazy? I'll give you four. That's all I'm going to give you. And if you don't like that, then you, 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 we, you, are, you and I are just not going to have any business. And he, he just clicked, hung up the phone. Took my car to the mechanic. Mechanic says, Mike, I've been trying to tell you all these years, you've you got to change your oil every 3,500, every 5,000 miles, or your motor is going to blow up. And I said, well, who in the world are you to tell me how to take care of my car? Y'all noticed I've been Ubering to church for the last month. <laughs> hmm. 
Now, none of that stuff happened. None of that stuff happened. But, but if my wife can have her own terms, if my banker has terms, if my mechanic has terms, don't you think it's reasonable to believe that God can have his terms? And his terms are, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And if you want to have peace with God, you've got to come to understand you can't saunter up to God any way, any time that you choose. You've got to do it God's way. He said that there is one mediator between God and man. And it's the man, Christ Jesus. I was down at Smithfield's barbecue not uh, too long ago, true story, and uh, I, I read where Frank Sinatra had come through uh, Laurenburg and, and he was there and he'd signed that, that thing on Smithfield's wall and all that kind of stuff and I read about that and I got to reflecting about the song that Frank Sinatra sang, I Did It My Way. And I remember watching the video of Elvis Presley singing that song, I Did It My Way. Let me just say to you, church, listen, that's the song of hell. The song of heaven is, I did it God's way. If you want to have peace in your heart, you got to come to God his way. Now, how do we find God? As he finds you, and you find him, how do you do that? Now, now watch this. If God speaks, you ready? If God speaks, then believe him. Watch verse 15. Came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let's now, right now, let, let's get up out of here and go into heaven, into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. Now, what could they have said? They, they, now, wait a minute. Somebody's playing a trick on us. Well, that wasn't real what we just saw, right? We just ate too much pizza. Or, or they could have said, well, you know what? It's so dark out here. Let's just wait until the morning comes and, and maybe we'll make our way over there tomorrow morning. They, they could have said, you know what? This is a bunch of hokey stuff. I don't it, it, no, the Bible says right then, right there, they got up and they believed what the angel of the Lord had said and they acted on what they believed. Church, listen, the Bible says belief without works is dead. They obeyed. If God speaks, then just believe him. If he commands us, then we are to go. They went straight to Bethlehem and they found Jesus. If God reveals something to you, now watch what happens in verse 17. When they had seen it, God revealed it. They made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. You know what one of the things that aggravates preachers more, pastors, maybe this is a better term, aggravates pastors that's seeking to make a difference in the community where he's serving. You know what aggravates him more than anything else? It's to have a bunch of church people that say, well, you know, my walk with God and my, my relationship to God is uh, it's just so personal to me. I, I, I just keep it between me and God. Let me tell you something, friend. God didn't give it to you to hold on to. He gave it to you to make it known. And everywhere they went, these shepherds were just blabbing the gospel. They were blabbing the truth. They were telling other people uh, about what they had seen and what they had heard. I don't mean to be mean. I don't mean to be ugly. But I'm telling you, friend, if you got Jesus, you can't help but tell people that you got Jesus. That's the good news. He came to save Sinners, and I am one of them. And I'm just saying to you this morning, you can be reconciled to God. We, we've had, we're coming up on that Christmas season next weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I, I don't know if we'll see all of this this year or not. Haven't seen the, haven't seen the rehearsals or that 
but normally we would have the kings come in and we'd have the shepherds come in and we'd have the wise men come in. And you know, I used to, I used to just get so caught up in the kings and the wise men because they, they would come in with all of their regalia, they would come in with all of their entourage and they would come in with pomp and circumstance and they had all of the great gifts that they could lay down and I, I got so wound up with that. But I'm gonna tell you what, I sure do relate a whole lot better now to the shepherds than I do the kings and the wise men. Why? Just ordinary dudes. Just ordinary dudes. Just ordinary people. They're like us. Most of us don't have some big dramatic story. Matter of fact, people probably get bored with my story. Just a regular old guy born out of western North Carolina to a moonshine bootlegger, mainly a drunk. Just an ordinary guy who had his first job when he was 14, put himself through school. Just an ordinary guy that God met brought me to my knees, gave me the good news, and I've never been the same since. And I've just wanted to tell everybody about him. Just a shepherd. You want a story? Don had a story when he left the eight o'clock service, sitting right back over there, about three fourths of the way back, God met him where he was. And he had all the situations, all the circumstances that brought him to the point where he realized, I can't do this by myself, I need Jesus. He brought him to his knees, he heard the good news. He believed the good news and he got up and he obeyed. And now he's got a story. You want a story? That's why God brought you here today. He brought you here to meet you. He brought you here so you could see the difference in who you are and who he is. Bring you to your knees. I can't make it anymore by myself. I need Jesus. And the good news is you can meet him. Today. You can know him. And he can change your life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.